Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the 52nd Midday Online Microfinance Conference. It's a great pleasure today to welcome Eric Campos, General Delegate for the Foundation Grameen Agricole and Head of the Corporate Social and Environmental Division of the Crédit Agricole. Eric has a great deal of experience in the banking sector and the mutual investment sector, but he has also worked for the French Agency for Development as Head of Assessment for the ACP, programmes Africa, Caribbean and Pacific. Thank you, Eric, for being with us today. We also have Jacques Affetor with us. He has over 15 years of experience in the field of microfinance. Jacques is currently the executive director of the MFI, Asi La Seme Solidarity in Togo. Asi La Seme Solidarity is a very active partner with ADA and the Foundation. And the mission of this structure is to offer vulnerable people services for social microfinance that are adapted to their needs. Today, Jacques manages a team of 130 employees spread around nine agencies in Togo. Thank you, Jacques, for accepting our invitation and for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. And then last but not least, Bruno Dankel, Director General of Impulse, a Belgian company that manages investment. They specialize in microfinance. Bruno, since the creation of the company, has developed, worked on uh, COPES. It's a, a vehicle of investment for social investment and it manages investments in Central and Eastern Europe. Bruno will help us to draw conclusions from this debate that I can see is going to be very rich and enriching. Thank you, Bruno, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you also to all of the participants. Now, the purpose of these midday meetings is to share the way in which we have worked together and collaborated and talk about the lessons that we have learned from this collaboration. When the pandemic began, each of our organisations had to face an emergency situation, had to provide immediate answers to new problems occurring and that would occur. There is, all, however, a very disruptive element that brought us all together. And that was the one that is linked to lack of information, the loss of closeness with our partners and the lo loss of closeness of the partners with their clients really had a strong effect and disruptive effect on us. Because with no information, we can't provide relevant answers to help and support final clients and also our partners on the field. This is when coordination between players became essential. Our three organisations, ADA, the Grameen Foundation, Crédit Agricole and Impulse, uh, came together and launched a series of surveys every month and a half on a regular basis in order to follow and analyse the effects of the crisis on partners and also on their clients. We gathered information, we analysed this information with the MFIs and the purpose as a priority was to better understand the situation on the field, better know or know better the impact of the crisis on their business, on their customers and in the end, as I said earlier on, to be able to support them better. So today we're going to share with the listeners the lessons that we've learned, our experiences and the way in which uh, we were able to work and collaborate together. I'm going to start with Eric. The discussions will be very enriching. You can all post questions in the chat box if you have any and there is also interpretation in English if you need it. Eric, the foundation has as a main activity to invest. They invest. You invest in microfinance institutions and you have been able over the past few months 
almost over the past year, we are soon going to be publishing the full report for the year, during which we uh, reiterated these different waves of surveys. So you've been able to use this information in practice, in real life situations. Could you give us some examples, maybe concrete examples, of how you made decisions, how you used the information, and what decisions you were able to draw from the analysis of this information. Yes, of course. Uh, hello to Laura and hello to everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, anyway, for inviting me. I really am here with you to share the way in which we uh, did things and organised things within the Foundation and what uh, to share with you what we learned throughout the year. First of all, I think we really need to say that we had never had to live through this type of situation, uh, the situation that started in February 2020. So in February 2020 we started understanding the importance of the systemic crisis that was to sweep all through all of the countries in which the Crédit Agricole Foundation operates. So we're present in approximately 40 countries. We don't know what is going to happen and uh, we have very vague ideas of what will happen. It's a systemic crisis and so we very quickly need to anticipate what is going to be happening um, in the banking sector that I am involved in. I've always been a banker. Uh, you have, we have learned from crises that you have to be able to identify immediately and look straight on at what is happening and see it clearly. Um, this, okay, in February 2020, what happened? Um, what seems to us to be the main priority is the liquidity risk. So we are faced with partners that will not be able to reimburse and they will have to push back their own repayments with their own customers. And we straight away need to set up processes that enable this risk of liquidity from occurring. And so there are two elements. First of all, we need to speak with all of our partners, all of our peers, and all of the sponsors and donors et that... Uh, et contre nous, uh, on puisse... Uh, we also... J'ai un retour uh, de la traduction uh, en moi anglais. Moi aussi. Ah. Bon, C'est pas gênant, mais enfin, ça va s'entrelacer un peu, quoi. Uh, voilà. Et donc... Uh, uh, so, I can... So we need to talk with the uh, donors and the uh, peers to avoid this liquidity crisis. And I have to admit that from ADA, um, the partner, there has to be a community of thought developed to deal with this liquidity crisis that uh, was happening. And so we decided to gather together approximately 30 sponsors, worthy donors, and we decided to draft uh, principles among ourselves that we wished to adopt in order to avoid this liquidity crisis. And among the principles, we had agility, we had to be very quick, we had to decide very quickly on um, pushing back repayments uh, to benefit microfinance, de... and we had to adopt the Co communication entre nous, the principles uh principles of communication, sharing of information. This was very important. And we also had to work as a community and put the means to intervene with technical aid or assistance to help the microfinance institutions. And this is what we did with you, Ada. And I have to say that I was very surprised, positively surprised or favorably surprised by the capability that we had all together to work hand in hand, really hand in hand, to, in order to protect the sector within which we operate. That was a first comment. And the second comment, which was very important for us, is that we had to talk straight away uh, with the microfinance institutions in order to be able to understand their needs and anticipate their needs. And so based on this, we set up an observatory for 
uh, COVID and the effects of COVID within the foundation, we were lucky to have exceptional um, people working on a temporary basis. They took over the situation. It was a situation of crisis. We organized things and we started sending out waves of questionnaires. For, they were short ones, seven minute questionnaires, so that the institutions could tell us which topics they had to deal with, how they were dealing with it and, and elements and I'll give you some elements of the feedback from these these forms, these questionnaires. And then, of course, we shared the information with our partners, uh, with long-haul uh, partners, Ada, for example, to understand together what was happening so that we could work and act uh, at the at the, for the best. And we need to understand this. What we did together avoided a liquidity crisis in the sector of microfinance. We don't talk about it because there has been no liquidity crisis. But the only reason there hasn't been is that we were able to work together with an, like an open book and open very, talk very openly about our commitments of the way in which we wanted to agree to the uh, delayed payments. And with the, for the foundation, we agreed on 30 or so uh, repayments, that later repayments, very quickly. That's 50% of the portfolio, approximately, in financial terms. And we had a very supple or sort of elastic reading of these financial topics as well. So what did we were learn via uh, the shareholder? I'll try to be as quick as possible if you, don't, if you allow me to. Now, the first thing is that right from the beginning of March 2020, we had the first signs of a moratorium and a pushback of the repayments from customers that were having an effect on institutions. We had a very strong increase, very quick increase, 30-fold of the risk portfolio. Some of the institutions were chose not to identify the uh, repayments and the delays in repayments. So some moved up to 30% straight, straight away, whereas normally in an area, it's 1% to 5% of delay in repayment, we were up to 30% or 35%. So it was very important that we understand why we had these uh, strong peaks. And if we hadn't understood this, we could have uh, stalled our own finance, financing and cut the liquidity of institutions. And that's why it was very important that we do this. So we saw that in March 2020. In July 2020, three months later, we realized that those the institutions that were resisting the best were the tier one big institutions they were resisting and the smaller ones that were more fragile and so that's when we did a survey on the smaller ones to understand what their issues were and we realized that they had needs in expertise on managing liquidity on creating continuity uh, business plans and so on and so we set a partnerships with CD and Lemen, Fifi Sock as well, and like you know, to set up very quick actions for technical assistance in order to accompany different institutions. In September 2020, we realized that the activity was picking up, and that's where we realized that the sector was very resilient, because four to five months after the crisis, that was a true tsunami, we could see that there was a recovery of business, and those were very positive signs for us, and just to cut a long story short, we set out a questionnaire so six different va waves of questionnaires uh, throughout the period one questionnaire every month a month or month and a half it was very important and so we realized that in the end the risk of credit weighed very heavily on the capital uh, of companies and approximately one and a half of our portfolio this is the result that we can draw today after a year of health crisis so half our portfolio does have requirements to have an, a strengthening of equity, which will probably be the second wave and the way in which we will be able to come out of this health crisis if we recapitalize the institutions, microfinance institutions. And to finish, we need to really applaud the admirable, really admirable work carried out by our partners. So the microfinance institutions on the field who were able to face front on the difficulty or problems that had never been seen in the past, and I th believe that if today we've been able to really strong hold strong in this sector of microfinance, it's thanks to the partners who on the field have done this admirable work, and I hope that we'll be able to come back to this. Thank you, Eric. It's You've given us key elements. It's been on each step of the uh, information process, and we've been able to adapt response, and this has been able to make things 
relevant and efficient, and this was also the case for us, for ADA. And I think that these surveys meant that we were able to clo get closer to our partners and really understand the situation and be able to respond to the situation in a much quicker way, a much more agile way. And so this is something you've just rightly underlined. Now, at this stage, I remember this just a year ago, we were also seeking some form of balance uh, between uh, our thirst for information. We wanted more and more information. We were asking for massive information and also a balance in terms of how uh, to not overload uh, too much our partners on questions of or s on questions or surveys, not ask too much from them to enable them to concentrate truly on managing this crisis at the time. So I'm now going to turn to, to Jacques. Jacques may be able to share uh, the other flip of the coin, or the other inf the information. So when we started the surveys, finding this balance between the information we required and not overloading too much was uh, still there. This is something that we tried to manage at best, but how did your institution actually uh, live through this sort of taking part in surveys and how did you actually use the information that was given to you or that you obtained or and that you requested so the request information the obtained aggregated data because of course we did broadcast the the results of the surveys in all of the different sectors thank you and good um, good afternoon to everyone well, I would like to thank you for, to, for allowing me to share my experience, uh, the experience of my institution. Now, to understand the impact of the crisis with the different FM, my IMF um, surveys. So I'd like to thank all of our partners and, and specifically Ada and the various other foundations that provided technical support during the strong moments of the crisis, the most difficult ones. Laura talked about all of the developments and it did of course have a strong effect on microfinance institutions. So our institution supports su supports vulnerable people in there and provides microfinance to these people in vulnerable situations. The sound is very poor, so the interpreting is very difficult. So now the methodology. We were able to note the impact of the crisis in 2020 on the way we did things. Given the fact that group uh, groups meeting is forbidden by the government. We noted the uh, positive effects of meeting with the beneficiaries. So grouping together beneficiaries was not able. So we had to gather information from various sources to have data available to help the beneficiaries. Now to come back to the question you asked, I would say that our institution has uh, responded to or answered several um, surveys since the beginning of the crisis. We found the questionnaire simple and easy to understand. So easy to understand and simple to fill out and quick to fill out, 10 to 15 minutes. We found that the information that was requested was very relevant and enriching. And then in our institution, the results of each from article are shared with the management team in order to draw links with the provisions that are already in place. This helped with the decision-making process. And in December, oh no, no, as an example, we decided to use this as a, um, as a structure. So we were looking for information just to find out whether the institutions were able to manage uh, deferred payments or unpaid installments. 
So with the conclusions that we drew in the, from the articles, we understood from the other institutions in the other countries that use the same structure as us, that they were able to hold strong during the difficult times of the crisis. And the articles that the foundation and different partners had made available following the different surveys really helped us to make the right decisions. It's a small, um, I think there's a technical problems from, I think Jack is, is offline. Yeah, Jack has a seriously difficult network um, link. Okay, so while we're waiting for Jacques to come back, maybe Eric. We, we heard that Asilasmi really used the results from the surveys and, and it didn't take that much time. So the cost efficiency uh, link or sort of ratio was very good regarding these surveys. It's very reassuring. So in your experience with the foundation, have you been able to also, or have you also been able to share, and also bilaterally and individually with your partners, have you been able to share articles? Have you had any feedback? Uh, have you had similar feedback? So I'm going to send this question to Eric as well. So I'll come back to you later, Jacques. We had a small cut in, the, in your presentation, although it stopped. Okay, so Jacques was saying this, and I'm delighted uh, to actually hear this, but we really wanted to avoid these forms or, f or, or questionnaires where we ask loads of questions and we don't actually use them. So we always tried to f set the questionnaires, the forms, so that we would have questions that we would actually have res results for that we would use. That was important. So if we are building questionnaires to last seven minutes. Jack said it was 10 to 15 minutes to fill it out. So there's always this distortion between the way it's built and the way it's actually uh, lived and, and, and carried out. So 10, 15 minutes is okay. Now that was the first aspect. Secondly, it was very important for us to publish the information because when you're in these crises situations, what you really need to avoid is the uh, break in trust through lack of information. Nothing is worse in a crisis situation uh, other than not, that, well, well, not having inf any information. Nothing's worse than this. So what do we do? We uh, worked with a small organization within the foundation. People who were in charge of doing this work pre-drafted articles, and then we reread them within the management team. And the management team met twice a week um, to steer, in the very short term, the foundation, accompany the teams um, who had to restructure and the different files and so on. And so we had very close presence between the management team of the foundation and the teams within the foundation. And that was very important for us. And we also used the feedback from the questionnaires a lot to be able to steer and also make choices. So a lot of transparency and this transparency also allowed us to um, feed information to our own donors. And as you know, the foundation was financed by the Crédit Agricole. The Crédit Agricole had questions about COVID in the countries in which the foundation intervenes. It's funded by the French Agency for Development, uh, by Poco Barco, the, inv the European Investment Bank, and other donors such as Amundi, for example. We, only ha we also have our own donors. And so we uh, had this information. We said, okay, we're in a crisis that's worldwide. It has a strong impact on all of our institutions. And this is what we can say to you. We have visibility this is what our institutions are saying to us and this was a very important aspect and as Jack says of course we felt also that we needed to share and feed information uh, to our partners so that they could actually understand that they were not the only ones to be going through these different difficulties and that they could therefore use the best practices from others to themselves as Jack just said be able to steer their own uh, operations and own business and so this is something that was very important. So we really did this strongly. We did feedback analysis, and then we sent it back 
as soon as the feedback was analysed, we gave back to the people who had filled out the questionnaires, all of our partners, the feedback, what we'd learned from the crisis, what our partners were doing, and so on. And so we were very lucky to have portfolios that were pretty representative, really, of what was going on. We had other partners, such as Ada, that joined us as well, but we had a size of sampling that was very representative per geographic area, because we noticed that there were different differences between geographic areas and size of institutions of microfinance. So the smaller ones could compare with the smaller ones in their own geographic area and the bigger ones in the bigger with the bigger ones and so on. This meant that we were able to move forward and each time we brought out a form of questionnaire, we looked at how the responses had been made and each time we set the question, what's the relevance uh, of this question within the questionnaire? That was very important. It was important that these institutions really understand that we, they, we were using their responses, their answers, to better carry on and understand the way in which they operated. Absolutely. On our side, uh, the AIDA experiment, or experience, sorry, was very similar. And I think that we really created a community that was surrounding, that sh surrounded this sharing of information. And it meant that we were able to do sort of some form of follow-up and monitoring of the developments within the crises uh, and it confirmed some of the risks we were expecting and it actually uh, told us uh, or did not or, or confirm others that uh, we had hoped we were f had feared would happen and didn't happen so it meant that we were able to anticipate uh, responses and answers to certain situations or questions now Jacques I'm coming back to you we now are going to talk a topic that's just linked to clients to customers Ada is at the foundation and has launched uh, launched the surveys with the partner uh, institutions, and we also promoted and verified tools that helped some microfinance partner institutions to be able to set off waves of uh, surveys with their clients. And Asi Destime was able to benefit from the support of Ada and the foundation in order to be able to carry out this type of survey or questionnaire. So what feedback can you give us, Jack, please, uh, to uh, talk about this? And what con real measures did you put in place following the results of these surveys that you carried out with your customers? Thank you, Laura. Well, we carried out surveys with our customers, three surveys with the support of pretty much all of our partners, the Grameen Foundation, ICD, all sorts of different partners. I would like to say that it's the first time that this type of survey with beneficiaries is carried out. It was carried out remotely and we owe this to Cécile de Cibes, who did a fantastic amount of work. We, we obtained a great deal of information through these different surveys, so we did work on the field with beneficiaries and we got uh, feedback on the situation of the beneficiaries on the field. Even the first survey was carried out between July and August and we this confirmed certain uh, things that we had um, we thought might happen and we were able to apprehend and deal with the crisis and for and and take measures to deal with the crisis so our beneficiaries and these results helped us to deepen the research that was carried out following the surveys so that's why how we launched in 2000 so we launched this the surveys in 2019 with the help of ADA and it told us which agencies were the most affected and which sectors of activity were the most affected so this was this assessment was carried out in 2020 with the result of the first wave of surveys we were able to deepen the analysis and some of the agencies were more impacted than others and we saw that there was also a deterioration of the portfolio uh, over the two years for some of the microfinance institutions. Now, the lessons learned, re the answers reflected the reality on the field for beneficiaries. We're still on the field, of course, and so we do affirm or confirm that the responses and answers reflect the reality on the field. The beneficiaries in rural areas were, were 
spared. The difficulties were really in the more city-based agencies. It had an effect, strong effect on the activity of the beneficiaries. We were also surprised by the motivation of the beneficiaries, pleasantly surprised. They carried on their business despite the crisis. The government took restrictive measures. Beneficiaries didn't. We thought beneficiaries might not need the credit because business not was not working. But with the survey, we realised that they were very motivated, and we also received a confirmation of the fact that many beneficiaries took out money from their savings to respond to the uh, requirements they had to feed their families. And faced with this situation, we reviewed our policies. We had to come and help them with renewing their credit lines. So if they, they no longer had, we removed certain conditions to enable those who were really uh, suffering from the impact of the crisis to access new credits and carry on being and enabling them to be able to carry on their uh, business. So we noted that there was a need to, to take part in uh, the sessions that were organized for financial uh, education or, finan or teaching uh, financial, financial training. So with the situation, uh, the situation as it was organized before will no longer be able to carry on. So we asked for help from our partners to adapt training sessions, financial training sessions, and the SPTA helped us to set up screens in all of the agencies to carry on broadcasting information about uh, the possibility the beneficiaries had to ask for a delay in pay repayment and also uh, to give them information about or information about managing uh, loans and credits and so on. And the relationship with the customers, similar to the beneficiaries, which was included in the report, was actually in in improved by the situation. So there were people appointed by uh, ADA or by institutions so that we could get in touch with these people directly and encourage them. Uh, before I hand the floor back, I'll say that we did have a great deal of recognition on the part of beneficiaries. After all of the systems that were put in place to help them, they really appreciated the fact that uh, they had been helped by the institutions. And this was there was a great deal of recognition, and this was marked by the reimbursement of as early as November, October last year, of the credit lines. From April, May, June, July, the portfolio uh, worsened, but from October, November, December, we felt that there was an improvement in repayments. So this was linked to the provisions that were taken to um, improve the situation for the beneficiaries, and that's why these results uh, were positive towards the end of the year. The beneficiaries understood that the solution was not just pushing back repayments, because if you push back repayments, it, it might take a year after a year. If the person doesn't have any business after a year, they will no longer be able to carry on their with their business. So we found other ways of helping these beneficiaries. Okay, this is something that was already part of our DNA, and it was really confirmed by the system that was put in place following the crisis. So a lot of our partners helped us greatly during this whole process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacques. And I believe that uh, this is very important, all of this question about partners. So in the first uh, board meeting that we had to, at ADA after the crisis, I remember that was the intervention from a member of the council who said, so what, how are we going to manage with this? How are we going to know um, uh, how our clients are? So the, and the clients of our partners, 
it was really at the heart of our concerns to um, better understand the situation in which our final clients were during the crisis. And it's for this reason that we really insisted on being able to convince sometimes um, some of our partners. Uh, it's not the case of uh, Asilia Lassime. We had to be a bit more, uh, uh, to insist a little bit more to have these surveys. And I remember this was done by telephone, external uh, telephone survey companies, and we needed to have an objective, uh, objectivity in the replies to be able to compare them, as Jack has just said, with what actually happens on the ground and the information that we got as we with agents who are on the ground. Now, Eric, it was perhaps the same preoccupation that you had at the foundation. And uh, did you, were you able to use these informa this information from the surveys to the clients. Yes, of course, in fact, what we were concerned with was to ha understand how the institutions were reacting, how were the final clients um, reacting. And so for the institutions, there were a number of, first of all, uh, in general, uh, I don't know whether uh, Jacques could uh, confirm this, but with his colleagues, perhaps, we uh, had we felt that there was a great sense of responsibility in the institutions uh, with their own um, workers. And the first thing was to protect their own employees, their own staff, and for the for, for sanitary and high, hygiene per, per measures against COVID. And secondly, to uh, use a maximum uh, to try and uh, palliate the social impact that there were very few inst institutions who were taking decisions to um, let uh, staff go. And that could have been the case uh, during crisis. But in fact, we observed that it was a point very, it was very important for us and our partners to make sure that uh, about the well-being of staff and uh, their, for their jobs as well, to protect their jobs. And that was very important that of the social responsibility of the institutions uh, of microfinance. Then we observed that the institutions were moving towards uh, to digitalization. Uh, those who seemed were less affected than others were those who had already put in place in their uh, network, their distribution networks, uh, a very important part of digitization. And that was then enabled us to as an institution, the digital word is very important to um, con connect with more clients and uh, have more resilience to this type of crisis. Unfortunately, I think that uh, what happened with COVID and it can happen with other pandemics, I think that we need collectively to uh, give a lot of uh, importance to the development of digitization of the institutions of micro importance. It's very important. And we also looked at what were the sectors which uh, were very important to say to, to, say to the institutions, look, um, the tourist section or trade, uh, you've got your local markets where it's important and they're very exposed and the institutions uh, will have a portfolio exposed on those sectors and they suffered. But however, uh, as us as Crédit Agricole, we had a particular interest in what we could say it was a good, we had a good surprise, we might say, uh, and it was very in this very difficult situation. And we saw that the institutions were increasingly uh, in agriculture and other markets, uh, and particularly in agriculture. They had a great capacity to um, withstand the problems and we are exposed to, let's say, 85% in rural zones. And that's the mission of our foundation uh, to support institutions to develop in rural zones. And these rural zones were better protected uh, on the basis of the samples that we looked at rather than compared to urban zones. Then 
The uh, questionnaires were very important to uh, provide this kind of information. And what was important was to listen because the institutions were each institution as a specific case. And what we wanted to understand was the daily life of our clients. And so we started uh, uh, individual uh, interviews with our partners. Uh, with those who wanted to take part in so 40 to 50 minutes of question and answer to understand what Jack was talking about, the fact how the final clients were bearing up to the crisis. And um, what we saw, what we glimpsed and what was confirmed was that the crisis was very, very affected people very uh, deeply. And we mustn't forget that the first victims of the crisis were populations who had um, little um, means and they had family solidarity, they had little savings. And they, I would say that unfortunately, uh, we are institutions and the microfinance in institutions on the ground, ADA and the Foundation, Grameen, and I think about other institutions as well. Um, all our peers, it, our, our mission really is important uh, in generally speaking during a crisis and if there was a uh, more liberal sector for in the economic sense I don't think we would have had uh, we would have um, coped so well and we have to have a long-term vision with our common values uh, when we were able to withstand the crisis and we saw to what point um, we have a very strong social mission and what brings us all together is that we work with these institutions with a very important social performance. Uh, Jack try, uh, has worked with them and with SPTF and with other uh, NGOs who are looking at the questions of social performance and social protection and our final uh, clients. Um, though we organized with us and it's very important and these institutions they acted they took action um, to give a direct response to the problems they weren't um, obliged to do so but they were operated in solidarity to protect um, people and that was also something which should be said is that these institutions of microfinance uh, can support financially uh, weakened populations, but they also have a, mo a more important role and they have a role of supplier of solutions and beyond the financial problem, they can also uh, give other kinds of support. Uh, they were responsible, but of course the, uh, these institutions must be sustainable but they have empathy and they have a social aspect to them uh, when they understand the vulnerability of the people and they were able to adapt um, uh, on the ground. And I think that was extremely important. And we'll perhaps talk about this later, uh, uh, that crisis very, very often reveal the profound values of the structures and our, our ways of acting and I think we've all found um, that we operated in solidarity among the strategies. Thank you, Eric. And despite everything, so the crisis are, uh, can bring change and innovation and uh, they can have very important interventions, sparks, they can be science uh, with the next SAM that we have in October. So the role of uh, MFFIs, beyond sort of financial services for resilience and other aspects. So crises are actually, uh, they reveal uh, the dynamism that we have. And it's always very difficult to speak uh, when a crisis really strikes. Um, as you say, Laura, the crisis, crisis must understand a lot about, our, must teach us about ourselves and we must call into question what we're doing and how we do it. Indeed, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Jacques, I would like to come back to you and we've got uh, much little, we haven't got much time left. It's very nice to discuss with you uh, together. 
but in terms of Eric uh, talked a little bit about this, these aspects linked to what we can learn, but above all, what are the perspectives for the future? How does your association uh, think about the results from the uh, questionnaires, the email and the uh, person interviews? Thank you very much, Laura. So, so uh, putting in place our mechanisms uh, that helps to serve the situation as we have and the decisions that we took in our association we've had were able to undertake these surveys and and so even though we're working with different organizations we for accounting purposes so we have an audit cabinet who shows how we can do things, how we are able to reply to the uh, questions of our partners. So I uh, have the surveys with a specialized uh, uh, consultancy uh, and that has, it means less work for us because the surveys have been done professionally and they require that we um, people go out on into the field and the uh, results are not always very reliable. So, so for this type of survey, we uh, have information which are uh, information which is uh, useful. So for the beneficiaries and for our own use to take decisions on what we need to do. So for the future, what are we thinking about? I would say that the partners who are with us, with our institutions uh, for these surveys, not only for organizing events, but they understand what's happening in our countries. And that's the first time that we did this type of service and with we want to see if the partners are going to get involved uh, for our sectors. So I think, Ada, we have started a process like this to analyze the um, services to the agricultural sector and uh, in the rural areas. So that's what I can say for the time being. Thank you very much, Jacques. So we have lots of questions which have been posed, perhaps before um, choosing some of these sections, because we've got lots of participants, more than 150 today. All the results of the different ways of surveys are available on the uh, respective uh, websites, ADA, Gramin Credit Agricole, and Impulse. And there will also uh, be the study, the final study, uh, which will um, leave in the coming weeks, which will be published uh, in mid-July, probably, which will show the main results. Um, I have a question um, that I can perhaps uh, merge into one for Asil Asime. The question is from a cl about clients. Uh, do you... Uh, were there sectors which were more impacted than others? And the second question is about the way in which you were you worked. Did you try to redirect clients towards other activities if they were had uh, were suffering more than others? Thank you very much for these questions. Um, yes, there are sectors which were very much impacted. So, for instance, um, the restaurant business catering uh, in schools uh, and in uh, high schools during the crisis, there were schools which were close. So they only had that kind of activity in a sector which was impacted by the crisis. There is also the beneficiaries. Um, so there was the, the closure of the border, so they weren't be able to get supplies uh, from one country to another. And they we also had the beneficiaries who are uh, in, in trade for clothing, for instance. 
um, for pan, for skirts and fabric. Uh, so people uh, were not dressing themselves in the same way as before um, because the cloth and fabric wasn't available. So they weren't able to purchase. So that impacted on the clothing sector. And also for dressmakers um, who were out looking for work. So what we did, so we uh, talked, we gave information sessions about diversification. So, and also awareness, learning, information uh, provision. But at the same time, we also identified beneficiaries who were, uh, were when, when I mentioned this, they, we supported them and they were certain designers who gave information to dressmakers uh, on about training about making masks. So they were able to continue uh, uh, their business and a way to produce masks and uh, to distribute uh, uh, for each beneficiary. But we, were able to then support the people who are making masks and give information. So this kind of information was extremely involved. And we also get requests from other NGOs. So when we talk about these new mark markets and the beneficiaries, they're trained and they can uh, still make have some kind of turnover. So uh, some even had 600,000 um, CFA. So we were able to support these people. Thank you. Eric, if you like, I will just carry on with Jack for a um, last question or uh, last but one question perhaps. So Eric already talked about the role of, of MFIs beyond the financial service. So a question asks, what role can play uh, uh, MFIs to support clients and, and the, on the, at the bottom of the pyramid, particularly for uh, food security and subsistence means. For us, I think that the essential thing was the minimum that we can do in is to, we have a government in Togo which with a system of contributions to support and to give financial contribution. So given that we have a, a, a team which is devoted to social issues, we can uh, give our information to our beneficiaries to how they can access state aid. So it's a type of activity that we can say, we're already there and that's their job. So we just need to have uh, to increase awareness about what is available so that they can support people who are really affected by the crisis. And that's how we've done. Um, we have also don't really have the means to give uh, rice or other, but we can show that we can, we can, with for food, um, we can't offer rice or other uh, services. We have the possibility of giving information about accessing. So, in fact, really direct information to the people who need it is very important. Thank you very much. Eric, there is a question I would like to ask you. Uh, according to the surveys, what are the main difficulties encountered by MFIs in their work and after the peak of the crisis? And where are they now? I think that the main difficulty is managing risk. That what we mean by that, there's a, a level which is a higher level of risk. Um, not everybody has gone out of the problem of the repayment uh, schedule, so it can be very difficult if you've got uh, if you have to refinance recovery uh, and growth, 
that means that we need to mechanically uh, take the risk over. So the difficulty is perhaps a bit technical, but I think it's very important that what we have, we sometimes have our own resources which have been diminished because there's been there've been losses. Uh, the institutions uh, have uh, had to absorb them. And so there's less uh, own resources away and risks have gone and we have to finance growth. So that is, um, I think, the main difficulty. Um, and the, then it's really to understand which are the sectors which uh, are at risk or are more uh, risky, if you like, so to choose which are the sectors which um, are, are more profitable potentially. So we have to understand that the context overall is very different depending on different regions. The foundation works in sub-Saharan Africa. There are particular cases between West and East Africa and we work in Asia as well. And we understand that the activities that depend on tourism, for instance, um, are, haven't started up again yet. So those activities are still um, confronting with major difficulties uh, to create value. And so the institutions need or uh, uh, have problems financing activities or clients who are working in this sector. So we can say to conclude that really uh, it's a message that we like to give to our funders and to development agencies that we need to tell them that they're probably in the months, the coming months, that we need to recapitalize the uh, microfinance institutions. We need to support particular sectors. And we hope that these great agencies will um, uh, be with us to recapitalize the sector. Indeed, so that's about the result of the last wave of surveys that we that uh, the results are available on our site. And this uh, shows the needs um, we have um, perhaps gone through the most uh, the situation of greatest emergency, but the recovery is still difficult, and we need to support our partners who have different business. They're different speeds of recovery, and I would invite you all to look at the last wave of survey results and the study, which is going to be published in July and come back to us, contact us uh, if you have more information available. And so time it really went through so quickly, we could, uh, we could carry on for a number of hours to discuss and sh share our uh, results and our activities of having worked together. But unfortunately, we have to stop here. So I would like to thank Jacques, Eric, for their being available to have uh, shared with us their experience. And it's the moment now for Bruno. Uh, it's a very difficult task to conclu conclude and sum up an avant to sum up uh, the region in which uh, uh, N plus come to have um, Middle East Africa, North Africa, different. So it's been very different from uh, what we have heard up until now. Thank you. So Bruno, you have um, the floor. Just have to switch your microphone on. Okay. Again, this is Bruno Dunkel. Thank you, Laura. We're very active in the EMOA, Central Europe and Eastern part of the world and then the European Union in general. Now, what comes out of the research has been reaffirmed even more is that the MOA zone is one of the areas that carries on being one of the most affected by this crisis. This is linked to different topics and this is linked for various reasons. One is Lebanon. This is a country which unfortunately accumulated uh, many crises over the same time. So the health crisis, the monetary crisis, the economic crisis that already existed, and now a social crisis that is a, 
uh, frontline social crisis. Despite this, we've seen that in other countries in the Middle East or Near East, the decisions made by the governments have been very severe, strict, and the effect has been a blocking of the migrant institutions for uh, a period of several months, and so, or stalling them. So this is something complicated. So from this point of view, we understand that the um, results and the inheritance from this crisis are uh, is something that it will be very difficult to, to, to deal with. Uh, we've invested on the Central and Eastern European area, and to date, this is the opposite situation is happening there. It's one of the areas that's been developing the best. There's been no long lockdowns. Economic business has carried on all the time. And the result is that the influence of the government was something that was essential in how the impact of the crisis uh, operated on microfinance institutions and the beneficiaries. And so I would like to come back also to this question of, of, of equity, which comes out quite strongly from the last survey that we uh, put out. I just want to say that 48% of all of the institutions uh, were, 48 percent of the institutions were um, surveyed or aren't, sent their, their results in and said that they had a problem with their equity because of the impact of the losses carried out over the year 2020. And so I do believe that our public authorities have a role to play in this, either via instruments linked to uh, development, um, development institutions or banking institutions or or actually locally we can see that many programs have been set up put in place locally they may be short to medium term programs and things have not been developed for the long term but the long term is happening now so we need to be able to look at this question of equity over the long term. It's going to become essential for the developing of microfinance finance institutions uh, from the beginning of this year and for the beginning of next year, from the end of this year to, and the beginning of next year. So there are difficulties and difficulties will uh, crop up, but we need to carry on making efforts to ensure that our partners and their beneficiaries are able to carry on reaping the benefits from responsible uh, investment or financing. You asked me what my main lesson could was to be drawn from the uh, results of the uh, health crisis and what the forecast might be. Well, Eric said this, we've been through a period that is uh, unheard of, systemic, worldwide, um, an exceptional or unusual situation. And what's essential in this situation is that we coordinate, that we uh, try and speak the same language and try and act all together as a group in the most responsible way. This is what we've seen with the donors, with what we've seen with the microfinance institutions. There's been a great number of initiatives set up also uh, within the network and also a great number of networks set up and these efforts must be pursued. And if we are happy or, or we can draw positive results from what has been done and this is why we are showing positive results today. Well, we need to ensure that we go even further than this. We need to encourage convergence of data, of practical aspects and practices of communication and also of encourage pushing, uh, putting forward our values as the with the client as the center. And while we do this, we must be also looking at strengthening our partnerships. That's our main, my main lesson, I would say, that I've drawn from this whole situation. Now, what are the prospects or forecasts? Well, we have said this already. A crisis is an engine for change. You need to be able to look at things positively, look at all that has been acquired, all that has been built. And once again, you need to consolidate. This is based uh, this is very much a competency, it's knowledge. I remember that when um, lockdown was set up in various of our countries, we, we had a meeting with the management, uh, of, with the board members. It was a panic sort of meeting, but 
what was essential during this meeting was, or what came out of this meeting was, the sh was sharing and acceding or accessing information as quickly as possible. All of the people involved, and more specifically those who have decision-making powers, agreed that this was very important. And this sharing of information is, of course, uh, was of course the underlying reason for our surveys. The purpose, of course, was to look at what had happened in the past. So we looked at previous crises and we looked at what information was available and had been available. And the result is that uh, the, uh, the things were quite different, actually, depending on situations. There were electronic libraries that were available where one could access best practices uh, to deal with certain issues. But my um, impression was that that these events had happened quite far in the past, uh, maybe pre or right at the beginning of di uh, the digital era. And the lesson to be learned from this is that we need to um, looking at consolidating further our knowledge and this experience to be able to ensure a better sharing uh, between the MFIs, the donors and the donors and their, with their various uh, operators. And partners. I think this is the best the best way, as far as I'm concerned, for us to prepare for the future. This is my opinion. Um, the future, as we can see, is not uh, yet all that rosy. Some regions, EMEA or Southeast Asia, are seeing uh, problems. Um, we haven't yet come out of the situations problematic situations. We talked about agility, anticipating, adapting institutions uh, of donors and decision makers, um, public authorities. It's very important uh, to underline this. And in different responses that I've seen, one I felt was quite uh, quite saddened me, and that was the one that said, well, it, why? It's to do with how we are preparing the best for the future. So this, we're talking about microfinance institutions, especially the very small ones, because, of course, they have uh, lower financial capabilities. So the priority really was on processes, products, and clients, and customers. And when we talk about redeploying and new growth, we always come back, bring these elements back onto the table, which is, of course, very important. However, there is one element that is pushed back uh, into the shadows, and that's insurance. And I think that um, within the level of priority uh, given to the microfinance solutions by the institutions that we surveyed, we can see that that this insurance question comes right at the end. But of course, the the one. But if you prepare for the future properly, you need to strengthen things in the present. And insurance companies have a, a way of doing things, and we can I I think find a way of working on this. Uh, first of all, on equity, so priority of course, is essential. This is an essential priority, of course, for the future. And also better risk coverage for future risks, especially through the insurance and microinsurance uh, systems. That's it, really. And this brings me back to saying one last word. I think uh, lots of people said this, Jack, you said this too. All of the institutions that we help along have done fantastic work. Um, on the field and throughout the period. And I'd like to say a big thanks to our teams. They've done this fantastic work. They were under a great deal of pressure. And I think that this is what makes the strength of the sector. The, they have a capability, we have a capability to work together as a community, to be united and uh, beyond any uh, sort of concerns of time or sacrificing other things we've it's, it's carried out, it's done, we've managed to do it, we've managed the first major issues and we're going to carry on all together and move forward and manage the next uh, hurdles that are put in our way. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. I think we've really gone beyond the time that we'd agreed to, but I really like the way you closed this uh, meeting with this spirit of community and, uh, and unification. So thank you very, very much to Jacques um, for sharing with us. Thank you very much to uh, the various other speakers. Thank you to the interpreters for translating the conference into English. Thank you, of course, to all of the uh, participants. And once again, thank you very much to the management for cooperation and humanitarian actions uh, activities in Luxembourg, in Fien, Fine, uh, they've supported us in this uh, event today. And then from tomorrow, the video for lunch, uh, from this lunchtime session will be available on our site. And I'd like to also uh, make an announcement. Today, we, uh, a few hours ago, received the confirmation of the fact that the Financial uh, African Microfinance Week will take place between the, uh, take place in Rwanda from the 18th of October onwards. And we hope this will happen. Thank you very much to everyone. And thank you for, to Eric and everyone. And thank you for taking part. Thank you, Ada, for the fantastic organization. Well done. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, wish you a good day. And hello to your teams, to Jacques' teams, to Impulse teams, and the foundation teams. Thank you.